Okay, so I'm going to talk about uh, some uh, uh, some tools that, that, that are in the FreeBSD system uh, that will help you uh, evaluate the workload that you're running on your systems. Uh, with the goal of identifying what are the, what are the bottlenecks that are affecting or limiting the performance of your, your workload. Um, so a lot of these things will be fairly common sense. A lot of them will probably be familiar to many people in the room, but hopefully I'll um, uh, show you a couple of, of tools or tricks that you might not have uh, come across before. So I've kind of broken these down into um, a few separate um, uh, stages. So, so the first, first stage um, that I think you should go through is to, to try and characterize what is the system actually doing. So it's important not to, to sort of go into this with preconceptions. You want to actually measure what your system is doing. Um, and I'll talk about some of the tools that, that exist to, uh, to do this for various types of uh, uh, various aspects of, of uh, um, system performance. Uh, and uh, these various categories, I'll, I'll talk about some, some ways you can go about tuning, uh, tuning based on the results of these investigations. Um, and uh, at the end, I'll just give some um, general comments about benchmarking. So uh, to start with, um, it's important to to uh, understand that uh, when we talk about performance, um, by itself, it's, it's a meaningless concept. There's, there's no number called performance, um, and it only makes sense to talk about performance if you have uh, if you're referring to a particular workload and with some particular uh, set of metrics, uh, set, set of measurements um, that, that you carry out. So you can talk about performance of a, uh, a web server um, and measuring the number of queries per second it can do um, against your, your website. Um, you can talk about how, uh, how, what is the, the response latency of your DNS server, how quick can it answer requests. So these are metrics and particular workloads. Uh, so characterizing the, the workload is, is, the, is the, uh, the, the first step, and you need to determine what aspects are actually important. Um, some things may not matter if your, uh, your, uh, your workload may not care about latency, if you just care about um, uh, bulk throughput, for example. And having done this, the first step is, is then to, uh, uh, to look at what your system is actually doing. So, um, Measuring, so when your workload is, is active, what is, what is going on? Uh, is it using CPU? Uh, is it interacting with the disk, with the network, with other devices? Uh, and uh, along the way, you, you might, might find things like uh, your, your applications are misconfigured. This is quite, common, uh, quite, quite a common uh, cause of performance problems. Um, you may be running into limitations of the hardware. Uh, your workload might be uh, interacting in the kernel with the kernel in strange ways. Um, if you have a multi-threaded workload, uh, the application may be uh, poorly, st poorly structured and, and running into a lot of uh, lock contention. And uh, finally, um, so this is sort of an obvious point, but it actually comes up surprisingly often. You just may not be giving the system enough work. Um, the, in other words, the bottleneck may not even be on the system you think it is. If you're part, if you have a network uh, configuration where one server feeds work to another, or it's, it's getting work from the, from the network from other clients, uh, you may not actually have enough work coming in, and uh, people can spend a lot of time trying to debug performance problems that turn out just to be, you know, the knob wasn't turned up high enough, and you weren't actually getting enough load up of the system. And typically, what you find is it's one or more of these things that actually is the, uh, the limiting factor. So once you've identified what it is, then you can go about um, actually trying to fix it. Okay, so a, a typical starting point is to go from a very high level overview of, of, of many parts of the system. We've got some sort of you want to get the pause, pause. Yeah, pause. Okay, okay. Um, so you want to go from a high level overview and then try to identify broadly what the system is doing and then based on what you see, sort of drill down to, uh, to lower, uh, more detailed investigation. So a really great tool is, is the top command. Um, you've probably come across this before, uh, but this gives a, uh, this kind of high level overview. It tells you things like, uh, is the system uh, paging to and from swap? And uh, this can happen if you overload your system with too many um, large processors, not enough memory to, to house them all, um, the virtual memory system will actually 
keep the system running, but it'd be very, very slow anytime you touch, touch the disk uh, because you're swapping. Um, so this is to show up there. Uh, it'll tell you uh, if your system is spending a lot of time in the kernel or processing interrupts. This can be problems. Shows you which processes and threads are using the CPU. Uh, shows you if they're inside the kernel, where are they, uh, what are they doing, where are they, where are they blocked inside the kernel. Uh, this is a little bit uh, arcane. Uh, it display, displays the process uh, weight channel, um, which is sort of a cryptic abbreviation showing where the process is blocked uh, in the kernel, in which which part of the kernel is blocked. Uh, there's no no sort of master list of these that that shows you, you know, for each of these these, uh, these abbreviations, what does it actually mean, um, apart from the source code. Uh, but as you get experience with the system, you can you can uh, start to recognize what these, these things actually mean. For example, you see that the new process is blocked in BioID or BioRW. These are, um, it's to do with, uh, it's, it's uh, performing read or write up IO. Uh, w drain is it's, it's trying to drain uh, writes to the disk. SB wave is something you see very often. It's not actually a, a problem. This is just showing that your process is, is blocked waiting for a network IO, waiting for input on the socket. Uh, uh, You'll see if, if your, your processes are waiting um, on a, a user, so a pthread mutex that will show up in the kernel as well. So you can kind of, over, over time, you can learn to recognize what these things mean. But uh, if you see anomalous things that look strange, then you can, you can you know, dig further and see what, uh, what they actually mean and, and uh, start to get some experience. So this, this, this is what top looks like. Um, Shows a bunch of things at the top, summarizing what processes are running on the system, um, uh, how many are, are, are currently um, on the run queue, how many are, are sleeping, um, how many blocked on locks in the kernel. This is interesting statistic. statistic. Uh, and this this snapshot here shows me that this, this workload is running uh, MySQL, um, and it's essentially using the entire um, the entire uh, CPU. Uh, actually, there are eight of them, but uh, only a third of the time was spent in, in user land in, in, in uh, running in the MySQL process itself, and two thirds of the time the process was was blocked in the system, was running in the, in the kernel. So this is actually uh, interesting, uh, and in fact, um, this this would be you know if I came across this, I would say that's that's strange. Um, let me dip down into MySQL and find out what what it actually what's it is actually doing. Uh, actually, I'll come back to this example a bit later, and here we can see actually that. Um, the, the, these MySQL processes threads are, are all blocked on on this particular um, in this particular state. And this is uh, so. In fact, um, this is to do with how it's, it's reading uh, reading from the database. It actually doesn't do any caching in user land. It's every time it wants to read from the database, it has to jump into the kernel to do that. And that's why these, these guys are all blocked here. And so we'll see see that a bit later with some actual traces. Uh, and then it shows you how much so each of your um, uh, the idle threads in the kernel, these are the guys that run when there's no other work to do. So it shows that, in fact, this is almost completely active, there's very little idle time. Uh, so the memory use is broken down, um, this is memory that's used by the kernel, uh, broken down into various categories. Uh, and in this case, uh, we, we're not using any swaps, so that's good. Um, some useful flags. The, the, the minus h flag shows uh, for every thread in, this, in, in a process. We have a separate line here, so this is actually running with, with top minus h and showing that here that there are five minus six threads. This is useful because these guys don't actually all use the same resources. Well, some of the, some of the statistics are actually per process. Uh, Assuming s uh, shows the system or the kernel threads. sh shows the kernel threads, and there are a whole bunch of others I didn't show here. So top is great for getting a snapshot of what your system is actually doing. Uh, uh, and uh, so here uh, we also see the, uh, the memory used by the process. So this raises the amount of resident memory which is the actual RAM it's using, uh, whereas size is the, the amount of uh, memory mapped into the process's address space. So the difference here is because these guys have actually ma mapped in uh, a, large, a large file. So there's uh, 500 odd, odd meg of, uh, of, of data map mapped into the process address space, but it's not actually being, it's not actually using that. Memory.
Okay, so moving on to looking at disk I.O. So disk uh, performance is, is quite a complicated thing to characterize, but um, there are kind of two key concepts. Um, that your workload is, is, is likely to be limited either by bandwidth or by latency. Um, so latency being the response time uh, when you perform an I.O. operation, how long does it take to, to come back? Uh, typically, random access I.O., so if you're reading from many, you're reading or writing to many different places in the file system, you need to, to the disk has to actually seek back and forth uh, to, to perform those operations, and this is going to uh, limit the, the amount of operations that you can actually do. Uh, whereas workloads that are more sequential I.O., so just writing in constant um, um, sequential stream, tend to be more limited by the, the transfer rate of the, the disk or the, the, the hardware. So there are a couple of useful tools that um, that I, I won't uh, present, but you can go and, and read the man pages. So IO state is, is uh, gives you a high level overview of what what the IO system is doing. Uh, Systat also does does this and, and some other interesting um, activity uh, metrics as well. Uh, one of the the most useful tools for for characterizing disk activity on FreeBSD is the GStat command, and this breaks down for every uh, John provider actually, so here um, I've shown a subset of the, the uh, um, um, disks on the, on the system, this is a CD, um, CD-ROM and, and one of the, um, the um, hard disks, uh, it, it shows a, a, a whole lot of statistics about what the, uh, what is the, the device actually doing, so, so this example shows that, um, okay, this, this label is wrong, uh, at this moment in time, so it sampled over, over a period of one second, and during that one second interval, there were uh, 1,200 operations performed in this disk, so read, write operations. Uh, one of these was a read, and the rest were actually writes, so reads and writes per second. Uh, LQ is the length of the, the queue, so these are all commands that are actually queued on the, on the device. Uh, it shows the, uh, the throughput uh, for reads and for writes. So here, because most of them were writes, we actually got about 15 megabytes per second um, of, of writes. And the interesting numbers for uh, looking at um, the load of the disk to try and find an overloaded um, situation are the, these, these latency columns. This is the number of milliseconds it took to satisfy these writes on average. So, over the course of a second, these writes were, were completed on an average of, of uh, 0.3 seconds. So, so this actually um, is quite high. So typically, if your disk is, is unloaded, you'll see um, latencies of, of a few milliseconds, 10 milliseconds or so, and any time your disk is, is, is getting um, very overloaded by, uh, by seeks or by, um, by operations, uh, you'll see this, uh, these latency spike up, and this is an indication that this is not able to keep up with the, the work you're giving it and performance is dropping. Uh, this percent busy column is, is very misleading and is commonly misunderstood. Uh, this, the fact that this, this column, this uh, busy number is 100%, doesn't indicate that this is at 100% capacity, which is uh, the common misconception. Uh, what this is actually telling you is the fraction of time over the course of, of this measurement interval uh, during which at least one I.O. Was, was active. So uh, we could have a single I.O. or a single s series of I.O.s, one after the other, um, causing the disk to be um, to appear 100% busy by this statistic, even though the disk is actually capable of doing much more work. So really, this um, this is, doesn't doesn't tell you uh, as much as, as you think might think it does about the uh, performance of your, of your disk, and really the latency is, is is more indicative of that. Okay, so so uh, going down into more detail, uh, the top command can actually uh, break down the I/O um, disk I/O per process which was a, a feature that was added uh, sometime in the last few years, I think it's not widely known. Uh, if, you, if you pass it to the minus MIO uh, switch, then instead of uh, displaying CPU usage, it displays IO usage per process, per thread. 
uh, it's useful to, to sort by, by total, um, total number of IOs. So, so this, this displays here the number of reads and writes performed by each of these threads um, over, uh, over the past second. It also will show you, so this is the total number of IOs, some of these two. Uh, shows you the number of page faults each process is doing, either the number of page faults in, and it shows you the number of context switches, uh, either voluntary or involuntary con context switches that each process is performing. Yes. Yeah. You said uh, reads and writes per thread, but that appears to be a per process number, right? Yes, yeah, you're right. So, so yes, this is another, another case where these stats are per process, not per thread. Thanks for pointing that out. And similarly, um, yes. So so it's. I think this percent usage is, is the is the per process value divided by the number of threads because in this case, so there's about 5.9 percent and there are 17 threads in this process. So each of these, so these are using all of the um, performing all of the IOs collectively. And each one of them is it's just sort of averaging over the number of threads. So so the, the stats are collected per process, but but this percent column is is, is average per thread. I think. Um, and similarly, the context which is a, a per process, but this still um, shows shows a bit finer detail what the, what the workload is doing. Here, for example, we can see that the sysbench process, which is actually a benchmark tool I was using to, to stress the database, um, it's doing about 77,000, 78,000 voluntary context switches. Voluntary context switch is um, when the uh, the kernel decides to run a new process because the old process uh, blocked itself on some resource. And in this case, it's probably waiting for, it's, it's sending a, uh, a query to the database and then it's blocking waiting for the reply. So uh, about 79,000 times per second it's blocking. And uh, the database um, processes, threads, are using most of the CPU. And these actually are being context switched voluntarily because they still want to run. The kernel's decided, OK, it's, you've had enough time. It's time for somebody else to run. So that's why these guys have all of the involuntary context switches. So you start to get, get more of a picture of what is actually performing the, the uh, I.O. on the system using top n minus n. Uh, caveat is that because of the way the ZFS is not integrated with the buffer cache, um, these stats come from somewhere in that path. And so I think uh, it will still display the context switch data and probably the page faults, but not the, um, not the actual I.O. data, which is perhaps the most interesting. Okay, so suppose we've decided that disk performance is actually a problem on our workload. Uh, what, what can we do about it? Uh, so, some general strategies for, for, for approaching this um, is if you contend it on resource, you want to try and, and, and spread out the load over, over um, multiple resources. So, uh, we could, for example, move, if we have two jobs that are both trying to hit the same file system, we can move one of them onto its own file system and hopefully on its own disk. And that will uh, eliminate this, this source of contention. Um, if you can't move them into separate file systems, you can do tricks so you have the same file system itself striped over multiple disks on the back end using something like G-Stripe um, or um, uh, other, other um, solutions. So th these, these give you one logical file system, but, but uh, multiple physical devices actually can handle the I.O. Um, concurrently. Um, this is a uh, uh, interesting point. If you if you have a, such a striped file system, you want to make sure that the, the file system boundary, the start of the file system, is aligned to the stripe size. Uh, so if you have a, a file system with um, uh, with 64k stripes, uh, then you want to align the start of the file system to one of those boundaries. Otherwise, it has to do I/O um, reading, say metadata from the start of the file system. You want if, if it was not aligned, then you would have to do actually two uh, two I/O operations to two different disks in order to read that metadata, and this can actually cause uh, if, by aligning this properly, you can get some quite good performance improvements um, that way. Uh, and finally, of course, you can always add better hardware or more hardware if you've decided that um, disk performance is, is your your bottleneck. So this is kind of a, uh, this next uh, approach doesn't apply to all workloads, but um, if you can make it work for you, it, it actually is a, a real, um, a real win. 
which is to try and restructure your workload so that you separate critical data and scratch data. Uh, critical data is data that, that has to persist after a, after a crash. Um, you might only have one copy of it or um, it would take a really long time to reconstruct, something like that. Uh, whereas the scratch data is, th is things like temporary files, um, things that you can reconstruct uh, on the fly, maybe with a little bit of effort, but um, where it's, it's not too expensive to do that. And if you can separate your, your scratch data out, you can use unreliable storage to, um, uh, to, to house that. Um, and then just pay the price of, of getting back if you need to. So this means things like you can use asynchronous mounts. Um, asynchronous mounts are really quite fast, but really pretty unsafe. And if you, if you happen to crash, either you lose power or the kernel panics or something, your data may not be there when you get back. Um, chances are it might, but you can't, you may not, it may be corrupted, you may, you may be missing chunks. Um, so uh, you, could, uh, you could do this and then, you know, um, check the data after you come back. Uh, you can go one step further, which is to store the data in memory, never even write it to disk. Um, and for example, uh, an easy way to migrate to this kind of setup is to use a memory disk. So you can use MD config to configure a memory disk and then mount that asynchronously, of course, uh, and store your data there. And so using the, uh, the, the swap backing, backing store is, is the way to go here. Um, swap backing uh, will you swap if it needs to, if your system is running out of memory and your kernel needs to, to push something out to, uh, to swap to make room, then files on your MD, swap back MD, uh, can be written to swap, but if there is memory uh, available, it will stay in memory. So this is the sort of best of both worlds there, and this is actually the fastest um, configuration for a memory disk than previously. So if you can do this kind of thing, it's a real win. Okay, so, so moving on to, to network, um, network uh, I.O. Uh, there are a variety of tools you can use to characterize getting a high level and then moving down to a, a very detailed level what your uh, workload is doing with the network. Uh, Netstat is, is the, the main tool uh, in, within FreeBSD uh, for doing this. Uh, minus W shows you what the network is actually, the, uh, the number of bytes and packets per second uh, sent and received by uh, by your interfaces, so you, you can at a first check, you know, does this make, match your expectations? Were you expecting there to be much, much more traffic coming in or going out? Um, next, that will also show you the uh, any protocol errors that, that, that might be there, things like TCP uh, retransmits or uh, uh, checksum errors. Um, will tell you if packets are dropped. Uh, for example, in UDP transmission, if you're dropping a lot of packets on on, on send, then that can be bad. Um, so there's a lot of data here, a lot of statistics about uh, the various problems that might be going on in the protocol layers, and uh, um, these can be the cause of some very strange performance um, problems um, to the network I.O. Uh, um, your network interfaces might be recording uh, um, lots of uh, packet collisions or uh, transmission errors, is it usually a sign of either bad need or, or a bad nick, or uh, often uh, it, it might misconfigure the, uh, the duplex setting to try to talk um, um, full duplex on a half duplex link that won't work very well. Uh, TCP dump is, is, a, is a great tool for getting into the protocol level. It's you, know, you need to know more, um, deal with more um, uh, detailed level um, um, analysis there. NTOP shows you, uh, breaks down network, this is in, in the ports collection, breaks down the network traffic per, I think, per port. Wireshark is a great uh, protocol analysis tool. Uh, these are quite complicated to use. So, things to do to try and tune performance. Um, uh, check that, that you actually don't have any packet loss or and things are actually configured correctly. Um, there are some, uh, some kernel, um, uh, Tweaks you can you can look at um, the uh, maximum socket buffer size is set by this disk control, and uh, this um, so you, you you want to tune socket buffers to for example if you're if you're dealing with uh, uh, a 10 gigabit Ethernet link and you're transmitting um, so UDP packets over this uh, you can run into the situation where um, the uh, the socket buffer is is is, is 
too small to actually um, uh, keep up with the, um, the rate at which you can push data into it. So uh, UDP will drop packets if the buffer, buffer gets full, so um, you can lose a lot of performance um, through this. You may need to actually uh, make some changes. If the, the source code is setting a, an explicit socket buffer size, which is too small, a lot of old code will set, say, 32K buffer size, and uh, that's really not big enough anymore. So some of these, these tweaks you can do to, to, to improve or to deal with, with UDP packet loss. Um, TCP is largely self-shooting, so there's not much to do there. Um, th there are some people who've reported that, uh, that this uh, TCP in-flight um, um, syscontrol causes performance problems in some configurations. I've not seen that myself, but uh, this is something you can look at if you're getting um, weird problems um, with TCP performance. Um, of course, don't discount hardware, it does fail. Okay, so uh, device I.O. Uh, is not often going to be related to, to workloads you're going to be doing, apart from you know, through, through, through the display. Uh, but uh, very strange things can, can happen. For example, so VMs that minus I shows you the uh, number of interrupts that are coming in per second from various devices. And you can get strange things where uh, if um, IOQs are being shared by multiple devices, which is shown by the plus up to the uh, um, device um, entry, then this can cause problems because each time an interrupt fires on this IRQ, all these hand interrupt handlers will be woken up to see if they should process the interrupt. And if you have things like multiple giant locked uh, drivers on the same interrupt, then each of these will wake up trying to fire the giant lock, and then they won't be able to process the interrupt. Um, they won't be able to check check that um, in parallel, so you get some serialization happening there. Um, so that can cause problems. It's not as much of an issue anymore um, because uh, as, as drivers start to be, uh, have, have become uh, um, uh, moved away from the giant lock. Um, and uh, to deal with this, if it happens, you can, in a lot of cases, just compile out the driver from your kernel if you're not even using the driver there's no point in, in, in loading it. Um, and Or you can try just moving the device and uh, moving it to a different PCI slot or something. Um, okay, so I, I've already talked about this actually with uh, top minus n showing the context switches per second. Um, this can be a sign of of uh, several things. It can it can tell you that that you will point to possible resource contention in the kernel. Um, it can also point to an application uh, design problem or configuration problem. For example, um, something I've seen with Java on on some. Um, some benchmark workloads is it was doing vastly too many context switches per second, hundreds of thousands per second, and spending a lot of time just context switching rather than actually getting any work done. And this can be caused by things like trying to use too many threads where um, the threads actually um, uh, doing too little work each rather than fewer threads doing more work. Okay, so looking at um, getting more nodes in, into the kernel, so the application um, performing uh, system calls, uh, so the uh, VM stat uh, minus W will show you the rate of system calls performed uh, system wide. So this is um, again a high level, high level view here. So, amongst other uh, things you can read about in the man page, this column here shows you the number of syscalls per second. And so, this particular workload was doing about 700,000 um, syscalls per second. Uh, and another interesting thing that we see in this is that two thirds of the uh, the CPU time was spent in the kernel. This is actually the same MySQL um, uh, trace that I, I showed earlier at the top. And so we can start to see more about what was going on there. So we saw before it was doing spending about 60, two thirds of the time in the kernel, and now we see that also it's doing a really high number of syscalls. And um, so I think this is interesting. And we start to look at exactly what that process is doing. So there are a couple of tools in, in the base system, Ktrace and Truss, um, also things like Strace and Force Tree, uh, trace, the process, trace the running process or group of processes and show you each of the system calls it's making. So this is kind of a, a, a raw feed of, of exactly what the process is doing step by step, which is a lot of data. You can see 
you can see trends or, or, or um, general features by, by sort of post-processing this, this data. Uh, and sometimes things jump out at you, which, which we'll see here. Uh, another related um, facility is the, uh, the audit subsystem in, in the previous new kernel, um, which was designed as a uh, sort of audit trail mechanism for keeping logs of, of process activity. Um, but it turns out audit is actually great for, uh, for debugging or um, understanding what your processes are doing. Um, you can trace uh, exactly what the syscalls are. It does things like if you're, you can tell it to, to log the um, arguments of, of exec call, uh, exec calls. So I, I use this, for example, um, to debug a, a problem where uh, running, building the index for the ports tree uh, was forking thousands and thousands of processes. And uh, using audit, I was able to, to work out exactly, okay, it's doing 10,000 of these, 10,000 of these, and a lot of them weren't necessary. So you can use this to then optimize, um, understand what, you, what your, your workload is doing uh, in some detail, and then use that as a basis to optimize. And because this is writing out a huge log file to, to disk, you want to make that fast and not slow down the operation of the system. So if you can log it to memory disk, that's, that's going to mitigate the performance impact. So using Ktrace, uh, I tell it to, to attach to a process and uh, to also trace any, any uh, children of the process. Actually, this, this won't be, wasn't needed here. <laughs> Uh, and then after some time, I told it to, to stop tracing minus C, and then to dump what each, each thread is doing, H and S, to, to suppress the uh, actual contents of the, these I.O. buffers. We don't need to know that. And what we see, if you read through the data, you see page after page of read syscalls. And it's doing peer reads, and then a bunch of them different threads, and getting the data back and doing some more. And it turns out that in my SQL, if you use the my, my ISAM um, table handler, um, it doesn't do any caching as far as I can tell in user land. So every time it wants to read data from the database, it calls into the kernel. And okay, the kernel has a copy of this in its own cache, but you go through this, this um, user the kernel transition each time, and actually there is a further problem in the kernel. We are hitting contention in the kernel um, further on, but uh, um, there's this overhead which you, you, you don't really want, where, where you, you want to cache data close to where you use it rather than having to go out and fetch it. So I'd say this is sort of questionable. Um, it turns out that uh, other, so IAM um, NNODB doesn't do this kind of thing, it actually does publication, so that's why it's wrong with it. Okay, so uh, I mentioned that, uh, that uh, High system CPU um, use is, is associated to uh, processes um, executing in the kernel. And uh, this can be from things like high syscall rate, as we saw. It can also be from, from lock contention in the kernel. And that's what I'll move on to now. So this, this often indicates a, a scalability problem in the previous new kernel. And uh, this is what we've done a lot of work on over the past few years in, in identifying and fixing these, these problems. Uh, but it doesn't always indicate this. Um, for example, if you have an application which um, is using uh, pthread mutexes and there's a lot of contention on the pthread mutexes in, in, in your application, then because of the design of the, of the thread library, when you have this contention, it actually bounces into the kernel and, and blocks in the kernel. Um, and so the, uh, the contention is sort of charged to the kernel even though it's a user um, application uh, problem. This can indicate poor application design or maybe configuration, misconfiguration of the application. So there's a very useful um, tool for for profiling what 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 is the what lock operations are being done in the kernel. Uh, so it shows statistics like um, so uh, how much contention is there on different types of lock, how long are they held for, which processes and which lines of code are actually trying to require locks. So th this is is very detailed knowledge that lets you pinpoint possible uh, um, kernel problems. So there's a, uh, a kernel option you can enable. Uh, it doesn't have very much overhead when it's not in use, um, fraction of a percent maybe. Um, so if you're doing development, it's a good idea to have this around so you can just sort of turn it on if you need it. Uh, because this is going to do a lot of um, timing calls, 
time exactly where each of your next operation starts and finishes. So it's highly dependent on the performance of your of your um, the time counter that's configured. Uh, so you can check that with these two sys controls. Um, and different uh, uh, different hardware has, has different available available time counters with different performance characteristics. We usually use the, the, the best one. The, the exception is that the TSC uh, is actually the fastest uh, time counter that's available on, on x86 hardware. But if you're on older SMP systems, um, it's not really usable because it's not synchronized between CPUs. They can run at different rates. Um, they can give different different results if you call on one versus the other. Uh, in older systems, it vary, the rate at which the clock ticked varied with the CPU frequency. So if, you, if your power saving kicked in and slowed the CPU, the clock would slow down, which is not very useful. Uh, it turns out uh, modern Intel systems actually have usable TSCs, so if you're on a modern Intel system, you can actually use the TSC. Uh, you have to make this change, make two changes actually to, to do this. Firstly, turning on the sys control to allow the use of TSC uh, at all. And then you often have to actually configure it explicitly with this sys control to tell it, yes, please use the TSC. And this, if you can do this on then the things that are very timing dependent uh, or timing uh, intensive, such as log profile, that will actually make a big difference. So to, to, to use it, you enable the sys control, run your workload, and then disable. And then uh, there's a, a stats sys control that will dump um, all the lock, lock data that, that was acquired. So the kind of, so that the data that it collects um, is, is shown here. So for each each file, each line of, of, of source code that, that acquires a lock, um, that acquired a lock during the profiling interview interval, uh, there'll be a corresponding entry in, in the output. Uh, and shows you which lock type was, was acquired there. Um, for each of these these entries, it shows the maximum time the lock was held um, um, in any one instance. The total time was held overall, summed over all acquisitions. Uh, how long we waited to acquire the lock, um, how many times we acquired it, average times held and or waited for, and some measures of contention, which are the number of times that we held the lock and somebody else tried to come in and get it, versus and also the times we tried to acquire the lock, but somebody else had it. So these are kind of opposite views of contention. So when you when you run this, you get an output like this. Um, you can read that. So I've, I've sorted this by the, the weight total um, column, which is one of the most useful. Uh, and this shows that uh, there were a couple of of, of, uh, of log operations that were about an order of magnitude, uh, spent about an order of magnitude longer waiting to acquire this lock than the others. And this is a signal that there's something's going on here. So looking over the right, we see that these were all actually the same lock uh, being acquired in three different places. So it's the, this user map SX lock and acquired it in um, MMAP, the MMAP code and some related uh, VM code. And so then you can go and look in either, you know, pass this off to a developer or, or look into the source code yourself and see what's going on. Uh, it turns out that this is showing high contention on logs related to, to end mapping of, of, uh, of memory, anonymous memory. And uh, so it's a, in this, this workload, this, is, this was the cause of, of high system, system time um, coming from, from this lock contention. So we can also see over here, if we look at, so this lock here was acquired 18,000 times and 11, Almost 12,000 of those times, the lock was contended on acquisition. So this is actually uh, quite a high. Typically, you don't want more than you know tens of 10 percent or so of, of contention. If you start getting much more than that, it starts to become an issue. Uh, and so we we had high contention here, and that caused this high wait time. We spent a lot of time waiting for a lock that was already held. Uh, sometimes these other columns actually become useful. If, for example, there was a uh, this, this, this might show if there was a, some, some code path where we ended up holding the lock for a very long period of time. This could show up here. So you can get other, other kinds of, of uh, information out of this, this profiling. Uh, previously, eight has a, another type of profiling of kernel um, uh, activity, which is a profiling of sleep queue um, uh, statistics. So every time a process is, is blocking going to sleep, uh, we record a wake channel. It's the same thing that showed up in top. This was the um, 
SPY and so on. Um, and uh, so, so sleep key profiling is very simple, but it's every time something blocks goes to sleep, uh, we record a calendar of, of what channels it was blocked on. So this lets you um, sub-load your workload uh, and, and, and understand where are the blocking points, and then this might tell you something is wrong or give you pointers about where to go. Uh, so we see, uh, this was my sub workload, I tried to find a workload that actually showed a problem uh, where, where sleep view profile showed a problem and, and didn't really find one, but um, this does show another another point, which is that uh, you can't just go by the raw numbers. The SP weight I mentioned earlier is this where this is the the, the weight channel when when your your uh, process is waiting for I/O in a socket. So it, it it got to this state a lot of times. This doesn't actually indicate a problem usually because it's just waiting for some work to come in. Uh, in this case, actually, this this uh, the second one, get block, is probably uh, does indicate a problem. Actually, this is uh, again the MySQL um, workload where it's spending a lot of time reading uh, reading blocks from the kernel, and so I think this is why um, this shows up here. Uh, if your application is is highly contended in, on pthread mutexes, you will often see things like umutex. Umutex is is the kernel path of the the user pthread mutex. And so if you're, if you're contending on, on a pthread mutex, you will see a lot of new mutex um, sleeping in the kernel. So this can show up here and it can tell you, hey, okay, you've got an application design problem where um, you need to restructure your pthread mutexes to not contend so much. Uh, there's a very useful um, tool called PMC, uh, which is used to, um, to profile uh, either application or kernel um, uh, Activity and uses uh, the uh, hardware performance counters that are actually built into CPUs these days. <coughs> so this can profile a whole lot of a lot of things, uh, but such things as, as counting the number of instructions um, uh, that are retired per second or per sorry over over a sampling interval. Uh, it can profile cache misses, uh, branch miss predictions. There's literally hundreds of of, of, of these counters that are um, built into the CPUs. Uh, it can do either instruction level processing, so it's telling you that at, at a particular time it sampled, the, the process counter was at this line in this file. Uh, uh, more recently, support was added for call graph profiling, so it can actually uh, record the stack trace. So it's, it can show you exactly how you got to that line, um, line of code. It has relatively low overhead because it's really using the hardware performance counters rather than doing things in software. Um, so this is, this is quite a useful tool. It's quite complicated to, to, to really um, use uh, in detail, although it's, um, well, I'll rephrase that. It, it's capable of, of many things, so it's, it's, it's quite a, a complicated uh, tool, but, but actually making use of it to do, to do useful profiling is not too, too involved. Um, I <coughs> recommend uh, this uh, Google for this, this phrase. This is an email that Robert Watson sent out at some point. Um, Showing sort of a very, very quick, um, quick start guide to actually using this, and uh, this is the man page um, documents the the options in full detail. Uh, the the work, workload is the workflow is, is pretty similar. You enable your kernel, uh, you run this command to start profiling, you run your workflow, and then you kill the command. So you run some background or another terminal, and you kill it once once you're ready. And then, then there are commands to actually take the take this output and post process it into a format that GProf can uh, understand um, or you could um, use the output directly. Uh, import, important caveat is that uh, until recently it didn't support a lot of the newer Intel CPUs so if you are running on a um, Intel CPU from um, the last few years it's not going to, to work. I think this is, uh, this is supported in 7.1 actually it didn't, didn't confirm this, it's supported in, in 8 now. Um, it, it presumably has been merged to 7.1. Okay, so, some some quick words on, on kernel tuning. Um, there's not a lot to do here because uh, the FreeBSD kernel is largely self-tuning. Um, the most important thing you can do is to run a, a modern version of the kernel because obviously all the work you put into this is going to going to help you um, pretty much no matter what, you, what your workload is. So you want to at least be running 7.0 or 7.1. Um, 
you should, if you haven't already done this, uh, evaluate whether the ULE scheduler can help your, your workload. Um, it's now the default in 7.1, but it wasn't in, in 7.0, although it was present. You just recompile um, to change the default. So the ULE scheduler will, will give, uh, on most workloads, a better inter interactive response. Uh, and it does a lot more work to try and maintain CPU affinity. So if you're running a, a process and then you have to context switch and then you context switch again and decide to run the same process, you want to make sure that you run it on the same CPU uh, if not too much time has gone by because there's a reasonable chance that that data or instructions that, that it may be using are going to be still in the CPU's cache. So you'll actually benefit from, from staying local with the same CPU. Uh, so this helps a lot of workloads, particularly uh, sort of mixed workloads where every CPU is not doing the same thing. Um, and there actually does matter if you switch back to the wrong CPU, then you have to, to reload the cache and that, that's going to slow things down. Uh, I have found workloads where ULE is not, um, not faster than 4 BSD, but this, I, I'm not sure this will actually show up in the real world um, unless you have a very homogeneous workload where every, every CPU is doing the same, the same thing on the same set of data. Uh, and the reason why 4BSD is faster then is because it, it has um, less overhead. It has to do less work to, to, to make scheduling decisions. And uh, on workloads where CPU affinity doesn't matter, then 4BSD might help you. But uh, typically ULE will, will be better. Uh, there are some things coming in. Well, FreeBSD 8 has, has support for something called super pages, which is um, a way of automatically uh, choosing to use larger page sizes. Um, uh, so by default, we use four, four kilobyte page sizes on uh, Intel um, systems. But the hardware actually supports larger page sizes, say four megabyte pages. And this really helps with reducing the number of TLB entries that your, um, your um, memory map needs to use. And you avoid, if you use larger page sizes, then you can, you can cover more memory with each, um, each TLB entry and avoid having to, to flush and reload um, TLB entries. So uh, FreeBSD 8 has super pages, which, which does all this promotion, demotion of, of, um, of page sizes um, in, uh, um, automatically, but it's not, not yet enabled by default. But this typically gives quite a, quite a bit of performance boost. Uh, turn off debugging if it's left on. Uh, development versions usually leave it on. Some people turn it on on their production kernels and forget to turn it off. Um, and things like term invariance actually has quite a large uh, performance impact these days because of all of the, um, the checking that gets done for each meetings operation and so on. So typically like 15, 20% that can, that can cost. Uh, the, I mentioned the time counter before. This, this sometimes comes up in actual application workload. For example, Java 1.5 does a huge number of get time of day calls. Over and over again, it's calling, asking the kernel what the time is. And uh, this can actually um, uh, can matter if you're using a slow time counter. Java 1.6 doesn't do this. Um, how am I doing on time, by the way? You've been going for 48 minutes. Okay, so we took five minutes. Um, okay, so just some words about benchmarking. Uh, I mean, this, this is hopefully um, pretty self evident, but um, benchmarking is hard to do right, so you really wanted to make sure that. Um, you sort of follow the steps. Um, you want to benchmark a, a self-contained test, something that, that is, um, clearly shows the problem that you, you're looking at. Um, it doesn't involve lots of other stuff which might change behind your back. Um, you want it to be deterministic rather than depending on conditions you can't control. So things like running, running the same workload, if you've got a workload that takes a minute to run, run the same workload over and over again as your benchmarking, or running your workload for 30 seconds um, on, on a constant load. When you're, you're uh, uh, trying to optimize, change one thing at a time. It's easy to get into the, to, to try and cut corners and say, well, I think these, set, these two or three things are causing a problem. I'll change these two or three things. And then, okay, you see a difference, but which one caused it? Um, so you change one thing at a time, it takes longer, but, but it really does pay off. Uh, and measure carefully. Uh, it's, it's also easy to fall into the trap of, you, you run, run your benchmark, you get some numbers, you run again, you think you see slightly better numbers, um, but you need to actually measure this statistically because there's things called the observer effects or um, um, confirmation bias where um, you're looking at, if you think it should be faster, chances are you, 
you'll, you'll look at the faster numbers and you'll drop the, you, you won't look at the slower numbers. So you can, you can sort of trick yourself into thinking things are better or slower when they're not. Um, so really, you know, try and, and, and avoid subjective decisions like that and, and just trust in the statistics. A great tool for doing this uh, in FreeBSD is called Ministat. Um, it's not compiled by default, but it's, it's there in the source tree, so you can just go in, in this directory and compile it. It's in user band, yeah. Excellent, okay, so it's, it's compiled by default now. Good, should be. Um, and what this does, it, it takes sets of, of, of files with, with numbers, and these, these are things like results of repeated runs of your benchmark. So you run your benchmark 10 times under the same conditions, you make your change, you run it again 10 times, put the numbers in a different file, and run through Ministat. And this uses something called the student's t-test, which is a statistical test that uh, determines essentially determines what is the likelihood that uh, these data sets differ and by how much they differ. Um, so this is what you get. Um, I have I made my two files here. This, this was the number of transactions per second that I got from a particular MySQL benchmark with either the 4BSD scheduler and then the thing I changed was I changed the scheduler to the ULE scheduler and kept everything else the same. I ran it in eight times. Uh, and this shows you firstly a histogram of, so this is along the x-axis, it's the, uh, the, the numbers, so it's, it's a bin of the numbers um, in the files, and the y-axis is the number of counts that fill into this bin. So we see here that, that the x's, which were my first file, the 4BSD results, are clustered down here. Um, the, a is the uh, average, uh, the mean value, and these bars show you one standard deviation around the uh, around the average. So 4 bsd is clustered down here, really is clustered up here. In this case, larger numbers mean, mean better performance, um, and shows you some stats about the, the numbers. And the interesting part here is it shows me that I can be 95% confident that Firstly, these data sets, something out of power, is it good? Out of power. Yeah. Um, does somebody have a. Is there a Hard it was to try to find a laptop running FreeBSD at the party last night. Your laptops, It usually takes a few seconds to wake up after you run out of power. Okay, well I think I have one more slide anyway apart from that, but just, um, okay, so, so that, that, that mini stack command showed me that uh, in this case, uh, the numbers did indeed differ at 95% confidence, and they differed by, the second set of numbers was about 30%, plus or minus 1 point something percent higher. So translated to my, what, what my numbers actually meant, that showed me that, that URLE gave roughly a 30% performance increase on this benchmark. So Mini set is great for doing this kind of, of comparisons, especially for a very small difference where you're not sure there's some noisy data, you're not sure if it overlaps or not, what's, the, what, what's really going on, and that, that's a great tool for that. So my last slide was just, just uh, okay, so right, you've done all this, all this testing, um, and you're not sure, you're still stuck, what, what, what do you do next? Um, so a good way to go is to, to talk to an expert, either a developer who knows the software, so if you're dealing with some applications that behave you badly, talk to the developer of the, of the application. Uh, if you think it's a FreeBSD problem, or something that, that FreeBSD users can help help with, talk to us. Uh, we have the questions mailing list, questions at FreeBSD.org. That's great for um, general sort of configuration questions, or um, sort of um, um, more general questions. Hackers at FreeBSD.org is great if you have a have a handle on part of the technical aspects of the problem. You think you've tracked it down to some part of the code. You're not sure, you know, am I understanding this right? Um, can I get some help? Hackers is, is, has more developers on it, so it's great for that. Um, and, uh, okay, so I think that was, 
that was the content. Okay, so I'll, I'll stop. Thank you very much. I'll be happy to take any questions if you have them. I had a, I had a similar problem with OpenBSD, looking at top output and looking at a weight state that I've never heard of before. Right. Why aren't these documented? Um, I, I guess the issue is it's very easy to add them. So it's easy to add a new weight state, mm -hmm. and uh, it's not something we've tried to to uh, to uh, to capture to, to to list these before. I think maybe if we got into a habit of saying somebody firstly going through and documenting what ones we have yeah. and then trying to get it convince people to as they add new ones make them add it to the list. I think it's actually quite useful because this these weights will show up all over the place in PS and top in all these things. And they can be confusing if you if you don't know you know often people see SB wave, they think all applications are stuck in SB wave. You know, what's the kernel doing wrong? And the answer is nothing, it's doing exactly what you told it to, it's the right thing. Um, so I think it'd be really good if somebody probably be a great sort of you know junior um, junior, junior kernel hacker problems just go through it's a bit easy to find them and then usually easy to figure out what they mean too. There's often a comment nearby or you can sort of you know figure out from the code what does what does this mean? That'd be yeah. a great thing for somebody to do, yeah. You're, you're generally expected to grab for the less well known ones. A lot of the yeah. drivers weight states are just some internal weird state of the hardware that the driver has to go through that if you happen to see it in PS or top won't tell you anything. Sure. Unless it sticks there forever, in which case we have bad hardware. Yeah. Yeah. So a lot of them aren't going to ever show up, but there are some really common ones which you know do show up all the time and those Oh yeah, I mean yeah. We, we should document SB weights and bio read and bio write and show sure. and then those that show up they also show up when you hit control T. Mm -hmm. um, and, exactly. and that can be a very useful Diagnostic, you're running something interactively. I've often thought that SB, rena SB weight should be renamed board. <laughs> <laughs> well, we could rename them all to be dash, and then our documentation problem goes away. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So I was just going to uh, say, say that it was addressed now. It would be really great to uh, put this in a bug for the project or to uh, send out the mail to hackers. This is really great content. I think there's a lot here that could go to uh, for a new kernel tuning article in the previous yeah. project where we also have man tuning and then seven which are basically from the previous e 4 next days and so these are really bad advice for tuning. Yes, yeah, so actually that, that's something I meant to put in, in this is, is tuning has it's mostly obsolete these days. Yeah. And yes, um, I think if we have nothing else we should really just file a couple of doc plugs and endpoints and people with this problem. It really do a great presentation slides to to be a starting point and you can do a lot of work just sort of transferring this content sure. That, that's that's yeah. my hope going forward this year. Awesome. Uh, I've wanted to do this for a long time and, and this uh, when, when Matt asked me to give a talk, I was sort of forced to actually do it, so that's a good thing. Cool. Right. So, Chris, the other thing that uh, Robert just pointed out is pstat now lets you, uh, you to stack trace uh, in the kernel uh, or where the weight states are in case there is an ambiguous uh, weight state. Which so, so he said a prostat? Huh? Prostat? Uh, Proxstat, sorry, yeah. I heard him wrong. Yeah, so that, that's, that's something that's, that's true. There's a new tool called Proxstat which, which um, shows the uh, tracebacks of things. So you should read the main page of that too. Yeah, it's a, it's a very useful tool. It is, yes. Yeah. Uh, have we done anything with GProf in the um, I've actually never really used GProf. Um, partly it's been obsoleted by PMC, and uh, GProf has a lot more overhead. Um, because it has to, to sample things in software. Um, I, I'm not sure what the status is even on SMP systems. If, if, if uh, so, okay, so, so GProf for user applications is probably fine. For so we have the kernel profiling. Last I used that. last I used it on a SMP system. It worked fine, but that was a few years ago. Yeah, I, I think it, it might have, Bruce might have fixed it, but I'm not sure. I, I, I haven't used that because at least my perception is it has it has higher overhead. Uh, it may not be true. It may just be complete prejudice in my Sometimes, no, some, yeah. That, but that tool does exist, and you know you could evaluate whether it, it, it's more. Just said, just to put on the G block in the kernel. Uh, 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 it's been typically when you compile a kernel with profiling, uh, quite often uh, it configures the compiler to insert uh, function sniffing hooks at the beginning of beginning ends of functions for doing basic block profiling. But it can also do fairly low overhead, just plain statistical profiling. And that's one of the things that we do at work. So we've modified the kernel at work slightly so that we can 
keep uh, basically zero cost uh, GPROF support there and we can just turn it on for a snapshot at any time. Can we have um, that change? Uh, that should actually come back in the previous <laughs> entry. It's actually, it's actually fairly useful. It, it's, it's free. It does nothing unless you uh, unless you turn it on. Okay. Uh, it can just basically compiles in a static buffer into the kernel, so it consumes about a megabyte of, of KVM, I think it is. Okay. Um, but unless you actually use it, it, does, it adds no overhead. Right. This is just running off, what, the stats clock or something? Don't recall. Okay, so, so it sounds like that actually is, is more useful than I thought. One of the things that we've been meaning to get back into the tree. Good. Should do that. Can you do it before you move to Linux? <laughs> 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 so, I haven't, I haven't poked PMC for the last few weeks, but has, has Joseph committed anything to allow PMC tracing the existing running processes? Uh, I'm not aware of that. All right, so just for everyone's um, yeah, education, right. basically, PMC will log, will generate pro profiling stats for existing running processes, but it's missing one bit of info that lets it generate all the statistics for existing running processes. And I ended up hacking up some something in Perl to do it just for my scoop profiler. But if anyone wants to get their fingers dirty and talk to Joseph about this, it would be really, really useful to be able to get a snapshot of a running system after it's baked for, you know, 12 hours. Um, the problem we've got for profiling squid is, is that running pro profiling it when it's just started versus profiling it 12 hours later can be different. And state state issue. let me just say, 12 hours of profiling data that you want to toss by having PMC stat run for 12 hours, it's, it doesn't work. Yeah. So that, that's the only real user issue I've had with PMC versus just a profiling with Linux. Is, right is being able to take a snapshot of the system, let it run for another few hours, take another snapshot. Sure. And, and again, the, the, tools does, the tool does everything except log when the exec happens, and then a snapshot of the VM space at the exec, which then PMC stack can pull out and generate the GPOP for us. So if someone wants to do that, because I really can't be bothered anymore, every time I look at the PMC code, it makes my head spin. Um, please do, please. Yeah, it's, it's worth pointing out that PMC is relatively new, so there's still a lot of Interesting and useful things can be added to it. Um, so it's another really great area that can really make a lot of difference to, to the community. People work on that. Yeah. Yeah, we try to, um, uh, Kai, please, sorry. Uh, we try to um, uh, do the kernel profiling, and we we find out that the, uh, the time spent on um, most of the time is on a, a spin lock. Then, then we, we try to figure out what's going on. Then we realize that we turn, when we go into the uh, critical region, we, um, the, the, the kernel code actually uh, um, uh, disable the interrupt. So I don't know if there's any way we can uh, get a, a accurate results on the kernel profiling. Um, um, yeah, so. So that's the issue Chris was speaking of, that on SMP modern hardware, the GPROF, the old style, is not near as effective. Because you block, you end up putting all this time on your critical sections uh -huh. instead of really where you wanted to see. So yeah, I would suggest uh, try using PMC for this. Um, it doesn't have this issue. And you can, you can tell where you're really spending time and where, where, the, where, the, where the CPU is spending time rather than where your accounting is measuring the time. Um, Hands up if you know how PMC works, if you don't know how hard, well, if you don't know how the hardware profiling stuff works. If you don't know how the hardware profiling stuff works, put your hand up. Alright, do you want to tell them or should I? Uh, you can because you made it on all the money. Yeah, right. um, basically the, the modern CPUs have counters which track stuff, right? So the easiest one is say, number of instru instruction cycles, right? Or, you know, L2 loads, L2, L2 stores, cache misses. Bus transactions, right? And there's two modes you can use them in on most chips. One of them is count. So start, get the count, like let it run, get the count. The other one is set a value when it hits zero or it overflows, send it, um, trigger an NMI, right? And so you don't get this, at least when I'm playing with it, you don't get this this issue with the, with the um, clock, you say, the Intel speaker says it, because you get an NMI after the counter wraps. On, I think it's on the Intel it counts to zero and on AMD hardware it overflows and that's the thing. So you get this happening on multiple CPUs and you get this happening through <coughs> this, the, 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 clock, the interrupt speed disabled. So with GPROF it's whenever the, whenever the time arrives, which isn't any good on current hardware because current hardware is bloody fast, right? And the number of instructions that gets run before the clock time hits is a lot. 
Whereas with the profiling stuff, you say every X thousand uh, thing you're measuring, set an NMI, it stores that and dumps that, that, that pointer out by PMC stat, and then you've got a whole list of where in the kernel the instruction pointer was, where in user space the instruction pointer was for what process. Um, and yeah, it really gives you a lot more interesting info than GPROC does. So try, try PMC stat or you know, or try for, for profile on the Linux and stuff. Try not to use GPROC if you can. Okay, I got it. I better really try it. Thanks. When are you finishing? I just wanted to make a quick comment on in-flight enable. There's a fudge factor you can also control on that. The higher you make that fudge factor, the less effective it is. The way you, uh, the way you use in-flight enable is it controls the packet backlog on the constriction point of your outgoing edge router. So you look at the packet backlog there, play with in-flight enable until the numbers are reasonable for what it can handle. As I mentioned, I, I'm not seeing the first thing being issued, but the sort of a rumor that goes around this, I'll, I'll keep that in mind if this comes up. It probably I'll needs, it it probably needs a, a, a comment somewhere in the man pages somewhere to say how to use it, because it's sort of obscure. Okay, thank you very much.